Hello, my name's Ajay Rai, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Today we're joined by Trevor Davies, who's the National Director of the International Relief Friendship Foundation here in the UK. IRFF was established in 1976 and has 80 chapters around the world. It officially became a registered charity in the UK back in 1985, and Trevor has been working as a volunteer with IRFF for the last five years. Trevor, thank you for joining Defining Moment. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Before we get into today's topic, which is about volunteerism and relief work, can you please share with us a defining moment from your life? Well, there have been many defining moments, uh, but I'll tell you about one recent defining moment. Recently, we went to Uganda to do a feasibility study for a project that we have just recently started. And I met the children from the Enseresta complex. The Enseresta complex is an orphanage of about 800 children that was founded by, by Reverend Isaac and Sereko. He um, founded the orphanage with no resources a few years ago and has built it up to a, a, an education establishment of great repute in Uganda, and they've become our project partners. But meeting the, mo meeting the children was a very profound experience because compared to us, um, their lifestyle is so simple compared with ours. They have very few clothes, many of them don't have shoes, and Reverend Isaac struggles to feed the children properly. Uh, they maybe they only have meat once every three months or so. And so, compared with us, they live very poor lives, but they're extraordinarily happy. And seeing the children sing and dance and the kind of welcome that we had was just extraordinary. You can imagine the tears rolling down my face as the children were singing for us. But something really struck me about these children, about, about me being in Uganda and why I was there. Because for some time now, I've, I've had a strong conviction about our commonality as human beings. And a lot of the work I've done over the years is, a, is to do with breaking down boundaries between religions and cultures and doing interfaith activities, those kind of things. And recognizing that we're all part of the same human family, that despite the differences, there is far more we have in common with one another than the things that separate us and divide us. And so I realized that those children are orphans, many of whom because of HIV AIDS, their parents have died because of HIV AIDS, are part of my family too. So their parents who died are my dead brothers and sisters. Now normally in society we have those kind of ideas, you know, about the commonality of humanity, the global village, these kind of concepts we've heard for a long time. Yes. But they're intellectual concepts very often. They're things that, that politicians discuss about, and, uh, but never really touches people's lives in a very profound way. But I'm not satisfied with that anymore. I would need to find, I've been needing to find a much more powerful, motivating force in my life to make life much more valuable, much more real. And so... I decided I need to make these concepts real. And I decided that if those men and women who died really are my brothers and sisters, then those children are as much my children as, as, those, as, those, people, as, as those people's children. And so I felt compelled in my heart, not an intellectual process, but compelled with a passion to really do something to help those children. Thank you, Trevor, for sharing that with us. As I understand it, IRFF is essentially a humanitarian aid organization, and it's, it's been doing relief work for many years. Yes. But there are countless organizations out there, similar and if not bigger, certainly organizations like Oxfam. So what is it about IRFF that distinguishes it in, in that sector of relief work? Well, you're right. There are thousands, tens of thousands of voluntary organizations, many of whom are doing international projects, the vast majority in the UK are doing projects within the UK, but still many are doing things abroad. Oxfam has a turnover, I think, in excess of 100 million pounds. 100 million pounds? More. That's international? No. Well, internationally, yes. yes. It's a huge organization. Um, our turnover is much, much smaller than that. Um, we don't have enough money yet to pay staff. We're all volunteers still. So 
in a way, although we've been going for quite a few years, this year is our 21st anniversary in the UK, we have an opportunity to have a fresh look at ourselves as an organisation and define the directions that we're going in uh, for this year, um, partly because of the project that we've started in Uganda, but also it allows us to create a vision for the future as to how we see IFF fitting into the voluntary sector and supporting our affiliates, our main affiliate at the moment being the Universal Peace Federation. Now that organisation is doing a lot of interfaith work, a lot of um, work with ministers of high level people and it's bringing together people through their Ambassadors for Peace programme, people who are good people, people who have strong conscience, people who have a deep desire to make significant changes in society but are not necessarily tied down by government policies or other selfish interests. They are able to do what is right because they know it's right. And so we've been able to look at our own policies and our own um, and our direction in that light. And so now we've become an organisation that is much more interested in solving the causes of poverty through the projects that we are constructing and devising. So for example, we're not just going to feed the children in Uganda. So that would be a good thing to do, is to provide them with food. They bought a 32-acre piece of land, so we're helping them to learn the skills that they need in order to grow the food for those 800 children. But we don't want to leave it there, because there's another stage as well, and that is to help those hungry people to then be able to help other people in a similar kind of way. So the project is designed to expand over a, over a number of years by sharing those skills and those resources through a skills resource centre to other districts, not just the, the orphans, not just the people in the local area, but to the neighbouring districts as well, so that a, a model farm that we're going to set up on that 32 acres can then be duplicated and skills can be learned through norm, numerous resource centres throughout the country of Uganda. So that's a kind of a philosophy. But it also means that we, in addressing the, the causes of poverty, especially the human causes of poverty, it brings us into a whole range of other areas um, in partnership with organisations like UPF and other affiliations that are now starting to develop, partly through their Ambassadors for Peace programme, but also through naturally networking with, with organisations that are wanting to address the same kind of problems. It brings us into the field of um, not just agriculture, but also education. Um, it means that we can develop conferences and start campaigning around issues to deal with poverty and even things which are political, but we'll do it from a, a non-political stance. So you're saying that IRFF is not just interested in finding these solutions which are temporary, but very much in dealing with the causes of issues such as poverty. That's right. And, I mean, and what are those causes? Well, the causes are numerous, um, and a lot of them are quite complex because they involve government policies, they in involve policies um, on a European or international level between the international trade organisations and big businesses and the way in which agriculture is set up on, a, on an international level. It means that very often um, farmers are not paid a very high, um, uh, an, honest, an honest amount for the kind of food that they're producing. A fair trade, as that's it's right, commonly called that's now. That's right. Um, but then there's also corruption at various levels of government. Uh, for example, when I was looking in Vietnam as how to, uh, the possibility of setting up business there, this is a few years ago, uh, one of the challenges were the kind of unofficial payments that had to be made at every level of, of government in order to make the correct decisions be made. So you had to oil the processes, oil, oil the, the mechanism, so that the decisions could be made by putting some dollars under the table, that kind of corruption. So in order to do good, you actually had to do a little bit of the bad, so to speak. Well, I suppose it's a, it depends on your viewpoint. It could be just it's another way of doing business. But, but I mean, I, I look at these organisations like Make Poverty History, which mm -hmm. made a lot of noise last year, and uh, and of course, figures like Tony Blair, mm -hmm. Bob Geldof, uh, Bonner from U2, 
And, and I think, well, if those guys with their political clout or with their credibility as personalities uh, can only get so far and still it seems like on an issue like poverty we're still struggling, what can IRFF, what can you do? Well, I think there needs to be a lot more Bob Geldof type people in the world making a big noise. And people need to take courage from people like him, but also step up to make big noise in a similar kind of way. Of course, IFF would love to have a patron of that kind of standing, somebody rich, somebody famous. But that person also has to have impeccable, impeccable integrity and has to share the same kind of values that we, that we have too. The problem with governments, of course, is that they are not always able to address the causes of the issues. They tend to take the easy option, the quick fix type of option, um, and don't really address the causes of problems, the causes of the problems. So um, they're always looking towards the next election and whether they're going to get in power, so they're trying to maintain power, rather than really addressing the serious problems that humanity is facing. I mean, take, for example, the issue of global warming. Now, recently, scientists have come to agreement about the causes of global warming, the effects of carbon dioxide emissions and other, other kind of emissions that are going on, because of, ever since the Industrial Revolution, this has been happening. But when are changes actually going to be made? When are we going to change, for example, our transport system so that we're no longer reliable on fossil fuels? When are we going to change our lifestyles? Now, if you want to buy an electric car now, you can, but it's very expensive. So as an individual, it's quite difficult. You might choose to walk or go by bicycle, but it's quite difficult again because of the climate in this country. It needs something which is much more far-reaching than just the individual's decision and lifestyle choices. It needs a real change in policy that really that develops the kind of technologies that we know are there much more rapidly so that to, 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 um, to, to, to prevent the effects that we know are bound to come because of global warming. Now, there's another aspect too, and that is the choices that individual people are making nowadays. So there is beginning to be a will from the people in that type of area. We can see how people, for example, are turning towards organic foods, for example, and avoiding uh, genetic, genetically modified foods, for example, or changing the way in which they, uh, which, which, which they get energy resources by putting small wind turbines on their houses. All of these things are starting to happen, but it's only happening because people are noticing changes in the weather. So for because example, they're directly affected. Because it's by affecting these them in a personal way. Right. That's right. Uh, but it's all a bit too late. You know, we know that those climate changes are going to affect us over the next 50, 70, 100 years. Um, and we don't know for sure whether we're going to be able to make the changes fast enough to avoid huge disasters in the future. So it seems like when it comes to the issue of doing relief work or <clears throat> getting involved in the the huge task of tackling world poverty. Most of us are not going to do anything about it until it actually, in some way, is going to affect our own personal lives, especially for those of us in the, in the West, I guess. Well, it's right. If I'm, if I'm knocking on somebody's door saying, please, would you like a make, to make a donation for the orphans in Uganda, very often they'll say, well, what about the orphans in this country? Yes. You know, because they want to see something that's, that's done at home. However, when you talk to those people, you say, well, actually, we are doing things for the orphans in this country. They're still not interested because they just haven't thought deeply enough about the issues. So it's a partly a process right. of education and a, and a change of attitude that, that is needed. Uh, people let's need a bit of a jolt sometimes in order for that to happen. I think you're right. Let's talk about volunteering. Yes. Again, uh, another issue which has been given quite a, a high profile Last year, for example, was the Year of the Volunteer. Uh -huh. There's the International Day of the Volunteer. Yes. And again, the UN and UNESCO organizations like that are very much behind it. Uh -huh. But are people actually really out there doing the volunteering? They are, actually. A lot of it's informal volunteering, you know, just people helping out their neighbors. But I'm much more interested in going beyond that into more of a cultural change where Again, this idea of common humanity, you know, if we're all part of the same family, if we really 
recognise one another as brothers and sisters, then a lot of the, the kind of policies that are put in government nowadays would just, just make a complete nonsense. The, the, and, and coming back to volunteering, it would be a very natural thing to help out somebody who's got problems and difficulties because they're part of your family. It's a kind of philosophical stance, if you like, but it, it's, it's at the heart of, of what we're doing in IFF and is motivating us to do more and more. And what we're doing now is working with people with that same kind of attitude, that same kind of motivation. And I think that will help us to create a very powerful and significant organisation in the future. So, of course, there's a lot of formal volunteering going on as well. And there are many organisations that people can find on the internet, for example, where those kind of opportunities are being offered. But in terms of quantity and the number of hours that people put in, um, most people volunteer for a day, a year, something like that, very, very small amount. And do they go back and volunteer again? Some do, yes. I mean, some people have such a good experience through volunteering that they want to do it again. Um, some students, for example, in their gap year volunteered to work with an IFF project in Kenya, with their IFF chapter in Kenya. Um, that was the second time they'd done it. Previously, they'd been to Guatemala and had such a good experience that they wanted to do it again. So you don't think there's this sentiment of, I've done my bit? I know that certainly used to exist when I was going out as a volunteer. I'm, I'm sure there are people who do a little bit of voluntary work to satisfy their conscience. But, of course, that's not enough. If we're going to have fundamental changes in society on an international level, then people need to be doing more to help one another their neighbours, but also helping people abroad as well, whether it be financially. Um, and I think about the figures I saw recently showed that about 49% of the volunteering that gets done is fundraising. So most of the volunteers out there are doing fundraising activities of some sort. Might be doing a charity collection or setting up an event or organising an event, uh, mainly to, to raise funds for their charity. So yes, there's... there's there's that at aspect of doing things to solve their conscience. But, you know, I, I'm seeing changes now in society, this slow, gradual process where people are beginning to think about and address their conscience more and act on their conscience more. And I think the, at the, 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 the effects of the weather is actually helping people to think about bigger issues as well. So, of course, like you said before, it's when something impacts somebody on a personal way. That's when they begin to change their life. But it also helps them to ask other questions about what is really going on in the world. And there are more and more people who are concerned about um, international trade and the effects that are, the, the, you know, the, the causes of poverty because of trade, uh, because of the health policies, the lack of medicines, the lack of investment in other countries, the lack of development in other countries, the relative amounts of money that's invested in arms trade and um, solving conflict, conflicts through further conflict, through, you know, through initiating warfare as a method to solve conflict, compared with solving conflict in a much more peaceful, humanitarian, compassionate way. People are realising that some of the old ways are no longer relevant and no longer suitable. So you're facilitating a kind of peace building through the service? That's right, that's right. Okay. So our, our relief programmes are not just providing food or materials for people in need, but they're helping people to understand, helping the needy people, or <laughs> perhaps that's not the right expression, helping the people who we're trying to serve as well as those who are providing the service to understand the value of each other as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, as part of a family. Okay. I'm going to pick you up on that because I noticed you, you used the expression brothers and sisters and, uh, and the more universal kind of expression of mm -hmm. one global human family. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that in the sector that you work in, using those expressions or, or even speaking in those terms, probably you come up against some kind of uh, a barrier, let's say. Uh, 
I know what you're saying, I can understand it, and I can sense the idealism behind it, but do you feel you're free to actually go out into doing your work as a volunteer in the relief sector and, and not be afraid to be idealistic in that way? Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. It's partly because I <clears throat> have spent a lot of my time in earlier years working in a religious context, sometimes as a missionary, sometimes as a, as a, as a, a lay preacher. But a lot of the work that's going on in the world today, in humanitarian work, is purely from a humanistic viewpoint. But in order to solve the problems, we need to address problems which are caused or at least manifest themselves um, in the religious differences and the cultural differences between people because that's where conflict comes about or where conflict is, um, appears. So we need to address those kind of issues as well because very often poverty comes about through conflict. You know, refugees, for example, are escaping from a place where there is conflict. They fear for their lives or they fear for their lack of, for their, for their freedom, for the loss of freedom. Um, and so they try to escape from that, hence they're a refugee. It's a human problem, it's not a natural disaster. So we need to address those kind of issues. And I was recently talking to a potential partner organization who is, a, who is doing some peace work and they've been working in northern Uganda. And we were talking about Uganda and the issues there and talking about the possibility of doing work. And yes, he said, well, you know, you sound very religious to me and that might be a problem. But people need, I need, this is one of the ways in which I'm presenting IFF and I need to be sure that people don't, don't see IFF as promoting any one religious cause or any one religious organization or any one religious idea. But we're talking about fundamental humanitarian human principles, recognizing the deep spirituality within each one of us, recognizing the value of religions and a religious way of life, um, people really value those things. So we have to include that in the way in which we relate to people. And if, I, well, if I come across as being a little too religious sometimes, well, I need to modify my language perhaps. But if people are mature enough, then they'll recognize that there's something good in what I'm saying. But you're finding people respond to it. I mean, obviously, you're going to face all kinds of challenges in, in, the, in the work you're doing. In, in some ways, I see you as just one man in a boat in an a ocean uh, full of possibilities. Um, what's encouraging you now? What, what are the, the waves of optimism that are coming your way? Well, you know, sometimes I do feel like one man in a boat, and those waves are very big, and sometimes it feels like I'm going to be swamped. But what's driving me forwards? Well, it's partly um, those children in Uganda and the experience I had with them. But it's just I'm becoming so frustrated in the later years of my life rather than the early years of my life with the way in which the world is moving forward and the dangers that we're facing. So frustrated, for example, with the conflicts that we've seen recently, in particular the Iraq war, you know, when the Iraq war was announced that we were going to war with America, together with America, to, to, to war yes. in, in Iraq. <clears throat> of course, I recognize Saddam Hussein's not such a good man, and the regime that he set up was, was a bad regime. But I had this sick feeling in my stomach, knowing that it was completely wrong, that it's not the way to solve conflicts, it's not the way to solve problems in the 21st century. We need a completely different way of doing it. So, you know, whether I continue working with IRFF in, in, in future years, I don't know. But um, I'm definitely a peace campaigner and definitely going to be living the rest of my life in that particular way. Uh, and what are your personal ambitions in, in that field? How, well, how I have an yourself? ambition for IRFF. The IRFF at the moment is still a very small boat in a very big ocean. Uh, and a lot of other organizations there are doing far more. And there's always a competition for resources. But because of the kind of values that we're um, adopting, um, because they're right, not because it's a political decision and it's a good thing to do, but because they're right, 
I'm finding more and more people who have the same kind of common heart towards humanity who we can work with. And this is very encouraging. The more I work in the voluntary sector, the more I meet remarkable people. And despite all the tragedies that are going on in the world, the more I see the, the goodness in people's hearts. I mean, take one, for, one example recently in America. There was a horrendous incident where um, a man murdered five young children from the Amish community in America. That was a shocking thing. And you can imagine the impact that it had on those families' lives because they do have a very wonderful sense of community amongst themselves. And it wouldn't be just the individual families, but the whole community and the people who know the community who were shocked and horrified. And people all around the world expressed their condolences. Now, that impact is very, very real and very profound and very painful. Um, but they, because they had that sense of community, they were able to forgive the person that committed the, 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 the murder and to embrace that person's family who would, must have felt guilty and difficult because of it. So there is that tremendous ability for people to love in the face of adversity. Um, the tragedy at 9-11, you think how many people stepped up to volunteer in those kind of circumstances, including IFF volunteers making sandwiches for the firemen, all that kind of thing, simple things, but things that made a profound difference to those that were all working together to, to provide support for those who were bereaved and those who were injured. So that, that's what's spurring you on the, the awareness of, of the goodness that is actually out there. Well, we have many choices that we can make in our life. And a, another defining moment, if you like, was when I realized that we have choices to make in our lives, that we choose what we believe. We can also choose what we feel. And if, if, you're, if you're faced with two options, two perhaps opposite beliefs or two challenging beliefs, you can choose which one to believe. A faith is rather like that. Religion is rather like that. Your opinions about a leader is like that, whether they be a political or religious leader. The, your opinions about your neighbor is like that. You can choose what to believe about them. You can believe somebody is good or somebody is bad. You can choose whether the future is going to be, whether you see an optimistic future or whether you see a pessimistic future. And where, how you determine which to choose is by considering the outcomes that result from your particular choice. So if I choose a pessimistic future, or to, to believe in a pessimistic future, then the options, the, the, the results of that personally would be that my life would be rather dull, rather miserable, and I wouldn't, be, wouldn't have a smile on my face, and I'd make everybody else's life rather miserable. So I choose an optimistic future. I choose to believe in the goodness of humanity. I choose to see the goodness in each individual person and help people to bring that out in their own lives through an organization like RFF and through our affiliates and so on to help them recognize those good qualities that they have and the good qualities that other people have. Now that to me is a much more compelling future and it's much more worthwhile working towards that kind of future where people truly live their lives as brothers and sisters. If it's a religious concept, well, so be it. But it's a human concept most of all and I want to work towards that. Sounds good to me, Trevor. Very briefly, if I want to find out more about IRFF, how I can get involved, what are the volunteering opportunities out there, what can I do? Well, we've recently put up a, a website. It's growing. It's still small, but we, we're improving it week on week. Um, and that's where most of the information is. And also links to the other IFF chapters, those that have websites and the IFF organization, the parent organization in America. And that website is www.irff-uk.org. Well, thank you very much, Trevor, for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can also find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.eu. Thank you for watching, and we wish you all the best.